afternoon, right? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, before I begin my sermon, I wanted to mention, last Sunday we had Promotion Sunday, and we had all those who are going up to the next level, the uh, Jam Kids going up to Hope Kids, and Hope Kids going up to Youth Ministry, Youth Ministry going up to College Group, and we recognized and thanked all the teachers. But my mistake, we didn't um, properly thank those who are serving and volunteering in the nursery ministry. Um, I made the mistake of saying that nursery ministry is just the parents who are taking care of their kids. It's not. Uh, there are two classes of nursery. There's the mustard seed class that's from birth, from zero months to 18 months, so about a year and a half, and then from a year and a half to three years old. So they're not babies. If you're three years old, you're, you're a toddler. But there are those who are volunteering to serve them, which is probably the most difficult age group to serve at our church, um, that are not parents. So it's not just parents taking care of their kids. So I wanted to let you guys know uh, my mistake. We do want to thank all of you who do volunteer and serve, not your own babies, but these babies that often cry and, and just need a lot of care. But just a few, like Florence, I know Deborah, Efren, um, I think Gilbert signed up to clean the nursery in the back and uh, take out the diaper pail trash and things like that. So there's a lot going on with nursery, more than just the parents uh, serving their kids. And so so thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, if I forgot to uh, mention you guys last Sunday. There's a lot going on with nursery. Now, with that said, you see up here uh, this, this uh, slide presentation, and week after week after week, we've been running it, and it's just been on a loop, and you see Brian Lynn, who's the head of our prayer ministry, you see him posing as Uncle Sam, um, and every week we highlight uh, specific prayer requests. Pastor Q just did it right now, and he prayed for these as he was uh, praying for the offering. We always include Rana, complete healing and restoration for Rana, who's in the hospital, as well as for Aaron. Uh, we switch off and rotate our missions partner every week, so it's different. This week is Pastor John Go. Last week it was someone else. Next week it will be someone else. And then we also continue to pray for Andrew Brunson, who is in a Turkish prison. It's, it's been almost a year, and we are still contending for his release. And particularly with everything that's going on in the world, what's particularly on my mind these days are the natural disasters. I don't know if you're aware because we're totally here on the East Coast, but if you've got friends on the West Coast in California, Oregon, even in the state of Washington, then you know what's going on out there the incredible wildfires that are happening out there. It's devastating. We've got really good friends in Oregon, and he is weeping. And I, I see his Instagram posts and things, weeping for all the park and all the natural land that is just growing up in flames in Oregon, as well as in California. Um, they're, praying for no, uh, they're praying for rain. They're praying desperately that rain would come and be able to put out this fire. Also then, the opposite. We've got Hurricane Harvey, the people who are devastated by the hurricane. Hurricane Irma's on its way. And these people are praying for a, just a break from the rain. They're praying the opposite, saying, no more rain, no storm surges. Please let the waters just go out and recede. And, and that's what they're praying for. And as Pastor Q mentioned, I don't know if y'all knew, um, his sister uh, lives in Houston. Um, and she's there when all this happened. My brother lives in Tampa. And we thought it was okay because... It, Originally, the Irma's path was projected to be more toward Miami and toward the uh, east, but now it's on direct path towards Tampa, where my brother is. He was supposed to leave today. He was here in Maryland all the past two weeks, but he was supposed to leave today, um, and he changed his flight to go home earlier to be with his wife and son. He said all the planes were empty. Uh, everybody's trying to leave Florida. No one's trying to go to Florida, so um, it was easy for him to get a flight in. And so we're praying. I'm glued to the news. I'm listening to updates, making sure my mom doesn't freak out. Um, I talked to them this morning, and I told them, if you guys get flooded and need to be rescued, I'm sending Hun down there with his boat. <laughs> and then um, they told me that they're not in the flood zone. Actually, thank God. They're not in the flood zone. Um, their concern are the high winds. So they're expecting the 140 miles per hour winds and tornadoes. The hurricane winds are going to um, spin tornadoes out. And so they told me that they're going to stay in the master bedroom uh, closet, which is the innermost place in their home, is the master bedroom. And there's a closet, and um, they're going to hunker down and stay there. So then I said, okay, 
If your house gets damaged by the winds and the roof and the windows and things like that, I'm sending Hoon down with his tools. <laughs> so either way, Hoon's probably going to go to Florida. No. Um, but we're praying again um, that nothing really, really uh, devastating happens to them as well as all the people there. So with all this happening, there's so many prayer requests, prayer needs. The call to prayer seems more urgent these days than ever before. And if you know Pastor Shin, he's a really, really good friend of ours, a good friend of Hope Church. Pastor Shin posted this on his Facebook just last week. If you see the date, September 6th, he posted, unless we are truly atheistic or totally self-absorbed, I don't know how we can avoid praying without ceasing in this hour. I don't know how we can avoid praying without ceasing in this hour if you know what's going on and hear what is happening. And this photo, he didn't post this photo, but I put it up here because we keep talking about Pastor um, Andrew Brunson. But this is not someone that we heard of far away. He's a friend of ours as well. This is a picture that was taken at Grace Retreat 2011. This is Pastor Andrew with Pastor Shin and our own Pastor Q. So he's a friend of ours. I don't know how we cannot pray without ceasing for his release. Um, and as Hope Church, we are an acronym. I always say we're an acronym, H-O-P-E, House of Prayer for Everyone. That's what H-O-P-E stands for. And as the House of Prayer, I want to speak today about how then are we to pray? How are we supposed to pray in the midst of this? And I want to look at um, passage Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 10. So if you all have your Bibles, you can open to Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 10. If you look at verses 5 through 10, we see that there is no break. If you're looking at your Bibles, you see that there's no break between um, verses 1 through 4 and all the, which is famously called the Lord's Prayer. Everybody's aware and everybody's familiar with the Lord's Prayer. That comes in verses 1 through 4. There's no break between 1 through 4 and then verses 5 and on. So this parable that Jesus um, tells is to illustrate and further develop his teaching on prayer. It's not something separate, but it's a continuation and further clarification for him. It's a continuation of Jesus' answer to one of his disciples' request in verse 1. If you look above in the Bible, in verse 1, the request is, Lord, teach us to pray. And then Jesus goes on with, well, this is how you should pray. Um, and he goes through the Lord's prayer. So in response to the request, Lord, teach us to pray. This is what he's saying. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are, and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So let me give you some cultural background here, um, cultural information first. Hospitality back in those days, I mean, it's, it's true today too, but much, much, much more so then. Hospitality was held in great high regard. It was extremely, extremely important. It was seen as a duty of everyone. It was seen as a responsibility for every man and woman. It was just something you did without question. It was duty. And a visitor was welcomed and cared for no matter what time of day they showed up. It didn't matter what time. If a stranger or a friend showed up at your doorstep, you were supposed to be very hospitable, generous, and care for them. And to avoid the intense heat of the day, it's not like they had cars with AC, uh, to avoid the intense heat of the day, people often traveled at night. So someone showing up at your door at midnight wasn't that unusual, right? It was pretty common because they're traveling when it's dark and the sun sets and it's cooler. So it's not that unusual. So here the would-be host um, dilemma is that a traveler, it says a friend, has arrived, and unexpectedly, and it's this guy's duty to provide a meal, but he has nothing to offer him. So to offer nothing would definitely bring shame and dishonor not only to him, but to his family, not to mention even his entire village could feel that shame of turning someone away hungry when someone comes to your door. So it's a big deal here. So what can this guy do? Well, he goes to a friend. He goes to a friend, a neighbor's house. 
no matter how late it is, and he asks for help. And that's pretty bold. That's pretty bold. Looking at the passage today, I want to speak to you about three specific uh, principles about prayer. And the first one being on how we are to pray is that we're to pray boldly. We're to pray boldly. Jesus is asking his listeners, which of you has the nerve, basically, to go and wake up a, a sleeping friend at midnight, and probably you're going to wake up his whole family, because it's not like they had all their individual rooms and sleeping on different floors of the house, but it's in the middle of the night, he's asking for bread, and the house that they're talking about here is probably like a one-room uh, home, and the father and his children and the family are all sleeping together on the floor, all in one place. And so you can imagine that if someone knocks on the door, and if you're sleeping in bed or on the floor, and you're, you know, kind of disturbed and you're waking up, you're going to wake up everyone else next to you, right? And so it's not just him, but it's the whole family. So you can understand this man's reluctance to get up out of bed, you know, waking up his family members. Um, and those of you with young children, you know. Those of you who have young children, you appreciate this situation because you know that once your kids are sleeping, you don't want them to wake up for no reason, right? You don't want the phone to ring. You don't want someone knocking on the door. You don't want a plane to, to a jet engine to fly overhead. You don't want your kids to wake up. You know this, right? And so again, I don't know if he had young children in the house, but you can understand this man's reluctance to get out of bed just to um, give bread to his neighbor. Let's look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. So initially, he refuses to help. He says, don't bother me. You know, go away. I'm already in bed. It's too late. But in verse 8, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, out of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So friendship alone wasn't sufficient enough reason for this guy to get out of his cozy bed and out of his slumber, right? But what it was, it was this man's boldness. And what it says here is shameless audacity. This is the NIV version. Shameless audacity is why he will get up. Hebrews 4.16 says, let me jump to Hebrews 4.16. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. But if you look, this again, this is the NIV. If you look at the New King James Version, it says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. The New Living Translation says, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. And then the MSG version, which is the, the message version, my favorite here, it says, so let's walk right up to him and get what he is so ready to give. So let's walk right up to him and get what he is so ready to give. You notice in Jesus' story here that the man asks for not one, but three loaves of bread, right? Not just one. And I find that oftentimes we are timid and we're shy about the things that we ask for, right? The things, our requests, we're very shy and we're very maybe um, timid and frugal about it. We want more, but we're afraid to ask for more because we fear that the more we ask, the better the likelihood that the answer will be no, right? So kids do this all the time. Kids do this all the time. For example, um, I'm trying not to use my kids in my sermon illustrations because, you know, they're sitting right there. Um, and so I'm trying not to put them on the spot of embarrassment. So I'm not saying these are my kids, but all kids in general, when it comes to ice cream, <laughs> when it comes to ice cream, uh, they want more, they want two scoops, three scoops, right? But what do they do? right? What do they do? They don't ask for two, three scoops because they know that the parent will say no. But they are like, can I have just one scoop of ice cream? And then most likely the parent will be like, oh, okay. But if you are so bold to say, can I have two, three, four scoops of ice cream? You know they're going to be like, are you crazy? No. 
you know? But so they'll say, can I just have one? Knowing that it's harder for us to say no to you for the one than for you to say straight out, can I have the four scoops of ice cream? And as children, that's often how we see our Heavenly Father. I think that's what it is. We think that he is not maybe, I don't know, rich enough or generous enough. And so we want something, but we don't want to appear greedy. We don't want to appear like, you know, too, uh, you know, demanding too much. And so we want this, but we ask for this, knowing and hoping that it's more likely we'll get this, right? That's true. I heard this story in a sermon somewhere, um, and I don't know if it was on the radio or in a podcast or something. And I, I think I probably told you this um, story before. But there was this Christian married couple, and they were college kids. You know, they're college, but they're poor, um, newly married, and they literally had no food in the house. So they're in school, they're paying for tuition and stuff, and they don't have much um, food in the house or much money for that matter. And it would be another two weeks before one of them got their paycheck from the part-time job that they have. So they decided to make a grocery list and ask God to provide. They wanted to make in faith. They said, let's sit down and make a grocery list and ask God to provide it. So on their list, they're going through and they wrote steak. You know, they're just writing the things that they want. And they wrote steak. But after a day or two of praying over this list, they thought that Asking for steak was too presumptuous. That's a bit much. We're poor, you know, beggars can't be choosers type of thing. That was their mentality. So they crossed out steak, and instead they decided to write hamburger. We'll just ask for some hamburger meat. The next evening when they came home from being out, they found a box of groceries on their doorstep. The items in the box matched exactly what was on their grocery list, believe it or not. And the next Sunday, um, there was a man from their church that came up to them, and he asked them, did you get the box um, of groceries that I left on your doorstep? And this um, young couple, they were like, oh, you know, thank you, thank you. We didn't know, who, you know, there was no note. We didn't know who sent it to us. And they profusely thanked this man for providing for them. And this is what the man um, said to them. He said, let me explain how this came about. He says, quote, the Lord just laid you guys on my heart and told me to buy you some groceries. God directed me down each aisle and told me how much of each item, how much of each item to put in the cart. But the funny thing is, when I went by the meat section, I first picked up some packages of steak. But the Lord told me to put them back and get hamburger instead. You see, often we ask for hamburger when we could be having steak. And I, just a side note, I wanted to say, this is totally not part of this sermon, but that got me thinking, you know, um, there are times when I feel like the Lord puts on my heart to, um, to send someone something, or care package, or to send someone money, or to give someone money. And I don't know if the Lord does that to you, but I want to encourage you on a side note here to do it. Don't think twice about it. Just do it. It's something that Lana always said. Lana says that there's someone on the other side of your obedience. And so my prayer, when I get that kind of, it's like a slight nudge. I don't want to say it's a premonition, but it's a slight nudge about, oh, why don't you send $200 to so-and-so? Oh, why don't you send, I just feel like I need to send $300 to so-and-so, right? I actually get excited about it because I'm excited because I'm thinking, Lord, I hope that that person is praying, God, I just need $300. Please put, you know, magically $300 in my Venmo account tomorrow or, you know, something like that. I'm hoping that that person is praying that and that I have the privilege and honor to be the one that God is going to use to answer that prayer for them. That's a that gets me so excited, you know? And so I want to encourage you, if you feel the slight nudging and, and the Holy Spirit, don't just chalk it off to, eh, you know, whatever, but do it. You may never, you know, you can do it anonymously. You can do it, um, you know, if Venmo, I don't think you can do anonymously because you have to be friends with them and stuff. But however you do it, and, and then the thing is, you may hear that, oh, my gosh. And I, I'll be honest, it's only happened to me once where they, so far, it's only happened to me once where someone actually then um, contacted me and said, I was just praying for that exact amount because I needed um, these books for seminary class and I just ran out of money. And so I wasn't gonna buy that book, I was just gonna borrow my friends, but that's the exact amount I needed for the seminary books. 
And that is more encouraging and more gratifying to me than I think the person who actually received the money. So on a side note, you know, about the steak and, and hamburgers and stuff like that, this, like this man, you know, so it's not so unusual if some of you who oh ye of little faith or unbelief, that God would lead you down aisle per aisle per aisle of a grocery store and give you a, a, a list of things to buy for someone. It's not that far-fetched. Do it. Do it. You don't know because on the other side of your obedience, there is someone. There is someone. Maybe they, someone is praying those exact items or that exact amount of money. Okay, so that was a side uh, freebie. So yes, we often ask for hamburger when we can have steak, you know? And scripture tells us that God's attitude towards us is one of love, generosity, benevolence, favor. You know, he wants to, he calls us family. We're his children. We're his heirs. Even right after this passage, it says, who of you has a son and asks for, you know, and, and asks for, I forget what it is, and then give, will give him a snake. You know, that's true. We're his children. And so we ask for certain things. He is our generous and loving and heavenly Father, and He wants to give us good things. He welcomes our prayers, and He knows what we're asking for, and He responds to them. So the first was bold, boldness, audacity, shameless audacity and boldness. Second principle of how we are to pray is we're to pray persistently, persistently, with perseverance. Looking once again at verse 8, Looking once again at verse 8, this translation is the NAS, and it says here, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So here it's translated persistence instead of um, shameless audacity. It's the persistence. When the friend first says, don't bother me, the door's shut, you know, I'm already in bed with my family, I can't get up now, go away. How do you think that the man felt, the man at the door who, who knocked? How do you think he felt? Probably felt disappointed, maybe frustrated, hopeless, maybe even angry that this guy's not helping him. How many of us would have turned around and left and said, oh, okay, sorry to have bothered you, and have gone? That's more like me. I'm very, I, don't, I don't like to bother people. Right? You know, the, you don't like to burden people. You don't like to, um, um, you know, make people go out of their way to do something for you. So some of us might be, if he comes by saying, go away, I'm already in bed with my kids. The pantry has been shut up for the night and, and I'm not getting up for you. And you're like, oh, sorry, sorry to disturb you. And might, you know, try to tiptoe away. But not this guy. Not this man. He was bold in his persistence. So when the man's request was first refused, he didn't give up. He was persistent until he received what he needed, and we should do the same, to persist and to persevere in bringing our requests to God. Now, you may see a, a slight inconsistency here. I just said that God is loving. I just said he's generous. He's willing and wanting to give you um, your prayer requests and the things that you want, right? That he's, um, but if God is our friend, who, like I said, is willing, who is able, and who is uh, ready to help us, a father who delights in giving good things to us, his children, then why do we have to ask him over and over again? Why do we have to badger him? It seems like we are almost begging, right? Because we're asking over and over again. I asked him today, I'm going to ask him again tomorrow, the next day, the next day, right? So it seems almost um, inconsistent here. As if we keep asking him, pleading with him, begging him, coming to him with the same request over and over again, as if he needs convincing. Or as if he's only going to answer our prayer request grudgingly, only because we nagged him to death. And so he's just going to answer grudgingly. Well, the purpose of prayer isn't to inform God of what we need. I know that most of you know this. The purpose of prayer is not to inform God of what we need. If that were the case, then after we simply state the prayer request, God, I need this. I say, God, I need you to not devastate Florida with the Hurricane Irma. I just request it once, and I'm done. I can walk away and not think about it again, right? If that were the case. But we're forgetting that God already knows, even before we ask him what we're going to ask him for. God already knows. 
If God already knows, then why are we even asking him in the first place, right? So prayers of supplication are not to transmit information. When we pray and request things of God and we're praying for people, right, on their behalf and interceding for them on their behalf, it's not to transmit uh, information. It's not like, okay, God, you know the hurricane's coming and, and my brother's in direct smack dab in the, in the path of this hurricane. He, I'm not telling God anything he doesn't already know, right? That's not the purpose. It actually reveals what's in our hearts. It says something about our relationship with God and how we view him. Prayer is not so much for God, but it is for us. God looks for persistence in our prayers. I'm sure you've heard this many, many times. Prayer doesn't change God. It changes us. You've heard that. Prayer doesn't change God. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and forever. It doesn't change God. It changes us those who are taking the time to spend with him and pray to him. If God always answered our prayers the way we want him to, straight off the bat, right away, there wouldn't be need for perseverance. You know, we want everything very easy. We do. I'm like that. I want to ask once, and then I want, I want to have it. <laughs> I want to have it. I, I only want to ask once. I I hate it when kids nag. It's true, right? You know, if, if one of my kids asked me for something and I said, okay, I'm going to get to it, and then a few seconds later they asked me, and I'm like, all right, I said I'll get to it, and then they asked me again, forget it, no. <laughs> then I'm not going to do it, you know? And a lot of times I think that's how we think, but it is in the persistence, and, and, and the persistence and perseverance is a testimony to our character. If God answered our prayers the way we want right away, there would be no need for this perseverance. But according to Scripture, perseverance is what builds our Christian character, and it builds our maturity, and it builds hope. Pastor Q prayed... Um, uh, gave a message a few weeks ago about the waiting. You know, we pray, we ask for healing, we ask for Pastor Andrew Brunson's release from prison, and there is that time of the waiting, and it doesn't come right away. But in that time, as Pastor Q was saying, was there's purpose in that time. There's purpose in that waiting. We may not understand it. We may not ever uh, understand it, but there is a purpose for that time and that delay, purpose in the delay of the answers coming. Our faith is tested oftentimes when the answers don't come quickly enough. Our faith is tested oftentimes when the answers don't come quickly enough. It's almost like as Christians, and I'm guilty of this too, the first thing is, I feel it is our duty to pray. I'm a pastor, I'm a Christian, so I'm up against something, I'll pray. But that's kind of like automatic. You know, of course I'm going to pray. I'm going to bring it to God and, and pray, right? But when the answers don't come quickly enough, if God does not answer me quickly enough, sometimes I'll take matters into my own hands. How many of you guys are guilty of that? I'll take matters into my own hands. I'll go for plan B. I'll go for plan C. In fact, sometimes even before I ask God, even before I go to God, I've already got a plan B and C in my head and in my mind. How many of you guys are like that? You know, you want to cover all your bases. Of course, as a Christian, dutifully, God, you know, do this for me. But I'm already, already churning and thinking in the back of my mind, you know, if God doesn't answer me quickly enough, sure, it'd be fantastic if he answers me right away. But just in case he doesn't, I've got plan B, C, D all locked up and ready to go right? And that's, that's a lot of times, that's our human nature, that's who we are, and that's how we are. We're not even going to give him a chance because it's in the hard thing of the waiting, the persevering, of pushing through, waiting for that breakthrough that we take matters into our own hands and try to make something and, and cause something to happen because the answers don't come quickly enough. Look at James 1, 2 through 4. It says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. It is important for us to go through the fire and go through the testing that it produces this um, character in us. And finally, regarding persistence, I want to look at Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. What happened to Luke chapter 18? 
Oh, thank you. Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. This is the NIV. Um, If you look at this, let me read real quickly. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. Is it gone? All right, I have to get my Bible. I normally, oh, is it back? Yeah. Okay. There's one more slide after this, I think. And the, for some time he refused. This is a judge. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she, will, she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night with persistence? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? A lot of you guys in your Bibles, um, at the head of this passage, it says, the parable of the persistent widow. It's about the parable of the persistent widow. Oftentimes, God cannot put things into our hands until he first prepares our hearts. Think about that for a second. Oftentimes, God cannot put things into our hands until he first prepares our hearts. It's kind of like, I always love this phrase from a few good men. You know, you want the truth, you want the truth. And he's like, you can't handle the truth, right? It's like that. A lot of times we ask for things, but we know not what we're asking for. A lot of times we're asking to win the lottery. A lot of times we're asking for this, for that, for that. And we do not really understand what we're asking for. And, you know, people say, be careful what you ask for, because you might really get it, type of thing. But here you look at this. God cannot put things into our hands until he first prepares our hearts. The other day, um, Yuhu at uh, Yahoo, Yuhu, Yahoo, Yahoo News, <laughs> Yahoo News was. Um, I, I have a, a account with them, and so all these um, news events and feeds come up, and they had this whole thing um, about lottery winners, those who won the lottery and those who squandered it or did weird and crazy things with it, right? And I was just fascinated, you know? And so I was clicking through, it's like a slide show, clicking through about all these people all over the world who won literally millions. But the thing is, most of them just squandered it or mismanaged it or, you know, they just lost it in a matter of a year or two. It's unfathomable unfathomable to me how you could lose $30 million in a few years, but it's more than possible. Many have done it, you know? It's just incredible to me. And so I feel like, you know, God cannot put things into our hands until he, just, he first prepares our hearts. So if we ask for certain things to win the lottery or whatever, I feel like God's not going to, you know, give it to us until we are ready for that answer to come. Someone once said, the greatest blessing of prayer is not just getting an answer, but being the kind of person that God can trust with the answer. Think about that. The greatest blessing of prayer is not just getting an answer, but being the kind of person that God can trust with the answer. The third principle that I want to bring up is we're to pray expectantly. So boldly, persistently, and now expectantly. The man in our story today, he went to his friend at midnight to ask for bread. He went confident and sure that if only he went and knocked on this friend's door at midnight, you know, but if he went, that he would get it. If he didn't think that his friend would give him the bread, why would he even go? You know, he'd be like, oh man, and he would just be in this great wallowing and shame and and whatever because he wasn't able to be hospitable to this um, person who showed up at his door. But he had some measure of confidence that if I go to this neighbor of mine, this friend, and ask for it, I will receive it. And again, I don't think he would have gone if he didn't believe that his request would be answered. Look at verse 9 and 10. 
So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Each of these three actions are imperatives. If you know the original Greek and the grammar of it, it's called an imperative. So our Heavenly Father not only hears our prayers, but he's promising to answer each prayer. He says that each one will receive, we will find, and the door will be opened to them. Why should we pray expectantly? Because Jesus promises us. Look at John 14. We should pray expectantly because Jesus promises us in in John 14. He says, And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Also again in John 16, look at this. I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. These are verses that he is, has given us in the book of John. So again, to recap, how are we to pray? How are we to pray? All of us pray. I'm going to assume that we all pray. But again, a lot of us is out of duty. A lot of us is maybe an afterthought. A lot of us, it goes both ways. Some of us, like I said, is the first thing that we do because it's automatic, but already having plan B, C, D there. Or a lot of us do everything else in our own power. We try to make things happen. We try to fix things. We try to do this and this and that. And as a last effort, you go to God in prayer. Which one are you? Which one are you? That is the question. So as the praise team comes up, I want to close with this. God is eager to respond to us. God is eager to respond to us, those of us who boldly ask, who persistently seek, and who expectantly knock on the door of heaven. We knock on the door of heaven with our needs and our requests. And in order for us to be committed to prayer, not just as a nice idea, Not just as, I said this before, it really irks me when the catchphrase of you're in our thoughts and prayers. Everyone says that. And I've said this before. That really bothers me when on Facebook and social media everywhere, when a disaster happens, when something comes up on the news, everyone responds with the phrase, you're in our thoughts and prayers. And my question always is, really? Are you really praying for this person, or is that just something you're saying? Really, are you praying for this person? Yes. (laughs) All of y'all should be saying yes. (laughs) All of you, right? And in order for us to be committed to prayer, like I said, not just a nice idea of making someone feel better and saying, you know, you're in our thoughts and prayers, right? But as something we actually do. We have to believe that it really does matter whether we pray or not. It really does matter. It really does make a difference. You know, it's so funny. um, When we were about praying for Andrew Brunson, sometimes we ask for prayer for certain things, and then I don't know if you've ever thought this, but you think, "Uh, I don't really have to pray about that. There's a million people praying about that. Do you ever think about that? There are certain things where you just feel like, ah, you know, I've got other things I can pray about, but this one, they've got this. People have got this covered. And, And, you know, you feel like that you don't have to pray about it, right? And so you pick and choose the things that you want to pray for. And that's true. God gives each one of us certain things, places it on our hearts to really move us to pray. And the things that God puts on my heart are different from the things that God puts on Pastor Q's heart. So he is passionate about certain topics and certain things. But I am passionate about other topics and other things that God's put on on my heart to pray about. So it's different for everyone. But the fact being, we just need to pray. And I want to end with this quote, if it works. One last, one last slide, Keith. Do it. Just one last one. It's the last one. No. It's the last one. All right, I'll read the quote to you. All right, it's a quote by S.D. Gordon. He wrote a book called Quiet Talks on Prayer. And he writes this. The greatest thing anyone can do for God and for man is pray. 
It is not the only thing, but it is the chief thing. The great people of the earth are people who pray. I do not mean those who talk about prayer, nor those who say they believe in prayer, nor those who can explain about prayer, but I mean those people who take time to pray. I just want to end with that quote. I mean those people who take time to pray. Not even people who preach about praying. Not about people who, who um, tell you to pray, or even those who lead prayer meetings and facilitate prayer meetings, but it's those who actually are doing the praying. And every one of us is the house of prayer for everyone. That is basic to who we are. That is what we need to be doing. So I want to close this with prayer. God, we thank you, Lord, that once again you remind us in the midst of just tragic events happening all over the world, political unrest, starvation, natural disasters, God, um, it's just everything, Lord, that we come to you as a praying people. Would you break our hearts for the things that break yours? Would you cause us to pray about the things that are on your heart? Father, would you draw us near to you into that intimate place of prayer, God, where we're contending for things, that where we are persevering, we are boldly coming before you, God, and we are expectantly laying our requests down before you. So, God, we come to you, Lord, with that. God, not as an afterthought, not even as a first thought, and then we forget about it, but in all our thinking, in all our thoughts, God, that it is what you have called us to be, to be a people of prayer. And so, God, more than any time, God, we so desperately need to be in prayer with you. As Pastor Shin said, God, unless we are atheists, Lord, unless we are so super self-absorbed that we have shut ourselves off from the rest of this world, how can we not be in prayer without ceasing? And so, God, would you call us and rally us to the cry of prayer, Lord. Even turning on the news, even looking out our, our windows, God. Even talking to our friends and neighbors and our family. God, that there's so much need and desperation and hurting people. Would you use us, God? Would you raise up an army of prayer warriors, God? That we would come before you in that place of humility, Lord. To enter into that place of prayer and intimacy with you, God. We thank you, God. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.